All right, well, thank you, Yousef and Igor and Sages for the invitation to come up and speak with you all. So uh, I'll be talking about, uh, we've been hearing a lot about retro rectus repair. I'll touch base on that a little bit, but mostly focusing on different aspects of TAR. Here's my disclosure slide, none of which are relevant for this talk. So uh, Vedra gave us a nice uh, history of uh, retromuscular repairs and hernia in general. Uh, when we think about retro rectus reef stopa repairs, uh, one of my favorite things is, is the philosophy of, of Rene Stopa, which was giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac. Um, you know, in a, a reef stopa retro rectus is still a wonderful repair, whether it be open, robotic, laparoscopic. It uh, has a, a great results, a low wound morbidity, low recurrence rate, and a lot, of, a lot of people consider this the gold standard for open ventral hernia pair. That said, it's, it's really good for, I would say, uh, medium to somewhat large defects, but there are some characteristics that may push us in more in favor of TAR or keeping it to a retrorectus repair. And while retrorectus is a wonderful procedure, there certainly are times where it's not sufficient. Uh, there are multiple ways to get beyond a retrorectus. There's preperineal uh, dissections uh, described. Now, that doesn't necessarily give you myofascial advancement, but it does give you a very wide plane for mesh reinforcement. Alfie Carbonell has written about intramuscular technique, where you dissect between the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique. The drawback about that is that you de enervate the abdominal wall by cutting through the neurovascular bundles, and hence uh, the development of transversus abdominis release. Uh, this is essentially an extension of the retrorectus. So you start off as a retrorectus dissection, and then you continue your posterior dissection and out laterally. And this procedure really allows you to, large, uh, allows you to tackle large and complex defects. And when I think about Dr. Stopa's uh, philosophy of giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac, I think TAR really epitomizes that more than any other procedure. As far as indications for TAR, well, certainly there's a lot of indications. I've listed what I think is, uh, is a pretty uh, comprehensive list. Large or complex hernias, sub-xiphoid and subcostals are a great way uh, to get these tackled with a TAR. The reason is, is that transversus abdominis inserts posterior to the ribs. So by dividing the transversus abdominis, you can get large superior uh, overlap of your mesh under the costal margin, under the xiphoid. How about peristomal hernias? Uh, um, uh, you can, uh, if, it, if it is a medial peristomal, you may be able to get away with just a retrorectus repair. But the bottom line is if you want significant lateral overlap, a TAR is a great way to achieve that. Uh, flank hernias. Now, if it's an isolated flank, either a, a lateral approach, uh, an open approach is still a good technique. But a, a flank, large flank, especially if they have a midline component, transversus abdominis gives you that access to that plane for reinforcement. Uh, Super pubics as well, and as well as other hernias. So, uh, part of this decision making is, is this patient appropriate for a retrorectus or are they appropriate for a TAR? Uh, of course, we want to look at the size of the defect. This patient has a large, wide defect. It's also very long, extends almost up to the xiphoid process. But as you can see there at the bottom, the suprapubic area actually has a decent amount of fascia at the bottom, which is going to be useful for fixation. But size isn't the only consideration when you're looking and evaluating a CAT scan. First thing, you want to look at the fatty distribution. Do they have a lot of visceral fat, or is most of their fatty distribution in the subcutaneous tissues? Uh, one of the biggest things that I'm going to look for when I'm planning out my TAR is the, is the musculature. How about looking at that rectus muscle? Now, uh, Igor mentioned this for, for, for his approach. Look at the patient on the left. We have a short, uh, balled-up rectus muscle versus that patient on the right where we have a nice, wide, splayed-out uh, uh, rectus muscle. That can help differentiate where if you think that that patient is appropriate for a retrorectus only dissection. The other thing to look for is that lateral musculature. If we see that patient on the left, they have a very robust musculature. You see three distinct uh, large uh, muscle layers, thick uh, myofascial layers. Compare that to the patient on the right where we see a very thinning out and attenuation, especially of the lateral components. And the last thing uh, I look for, at least on this slide, is that of the overall muscle distribution and sarcopenia. If we see that paraspinous muscle on the patient on the right, we see a lot of marbling in there, a lot of fatty uh, infiltration of that muscle. Compared to, that to, compared to that to the muscular uh, component on the left with that paraspinous, and uh, there's a lot of studies out there uh, that show that sarcopenia can be a risk factor for, for complications, wound morbidity, uh, following uh, various surgeries. Now, we, we're still determining that, if that is true for, for ventral hernia patients, but a lot of data, especially uh, in malignancy patients, that sarcopenia can be a predictor for, for complications. How about specific uh, anatomical defects, sub xiphoid defects? Uh, this the defect goes right up to the bone there for the xiphoid process from an from a incisional hernia from a previous sternotomy and non-healing uh, of the sternum. 
And uh, again, these are, very, these are very challenging defects to repair. And this is about an eight to nine centimeter defect. So there's gonna be some tension on your closure. And again, because the transversus abdominis inserts posterior to this layer, by releasing that, you're gonna get large overlap under the xiphoid process up to the central tendon of the diaphragm. Uh, this patient has multiple defects, moderate size defects uh, superiorly, small to medium centrally, but look at the, where they placed that stoma on this patient uh, previously. Now the stoma is taken down, but you can see that left lower quadrant defect. It's close to the pelvis, it's out far laterally. This is gonna be one that's gonna be uh, close to impossible to do with just a retrorectus only. Uh, now, we heard a lot about minimally invasive techniques for retromuscular repairs, and uh, there's certainly some overlap on indications for open versus a minimally invasive approach. First thing is size, though. You know, with an open uh, technique, uh, open technique is going to tackle very large uh, hernias. Uh, for robotic or, or other laparoscopic repairs, um, I don't know if we're there yet for very, very large defects. Um, I think the biggest thing determinant as far as doing a minimally invasive approach is, uh, is really your skill set with laparoscopy or robotics. These are complex procedures, and I really think you gotta know your anatomy, and really hone that anatomy in, in an open technique uh, before you really embark on complex ab ball uh, with, the, with the robot. Um, that said, it's a wonderful tool. We've seen some great examples of the benefits of minimally invasive approaches. That said, I think the biggest determinant when you're gonna go for a minimally invasive or open approach is that for wound pathology. When you look at patients like this, where you have chronic non-healing ulcers, uh, you have multiple ostomies, you have uh, other skin uh, morbidity, you have skin grafts, these patients aren't necessarily appropriate uh, for a, a robotic or laparoscopic, uh, a laparoscopic approach. These are patients you want to be able to excise, debride the skin. Um, now that said, that patient in the lower right, that patient may be a good example of a hybrid approach where you do your minimally invasive approach to get the hernia repaired, and then right at the end of the case, uh, you can excise uh, any redundant uh, skin. How about these patients? Now, these patients may be more appropriate for a minimally invasive approach. They're relatively straightforward. They're centralized defects. Um, some of them are larger than others. Uh, and remember, we can't just go by just the hernia sac. The defect, actually, in that lower right one is a much smaller than what the hernia sac shows us. Um, and, and that said, if you ask me when do I choose robotic versus open uh, for these approaches, this is what I'm thinking now, but in a couple years as, uh, as our techniques evolve, as we get more accustomed to more advanced and complex robotic repairs, I may shift some of these patients around. Maybe some of them are more appropriate for a robotic approach. Well, we can't talk about when to do TAR without talking when not to do TAR. Uh, I think uh, the, one of the best examples is in the acute setting. Patients that have an acute trauma, uh, or some type of, of, of acute uh, intra-abdominal disaster, perforated bowel or whatnot. Uh, these are patients that are hypermetabolic, uh, especially catabolic. They're malnourished. They likely have uh, some type of wound contamination. These are not the patients that you want to embark on a complex abdominal wall reconstruction. These are patients you got to temporize, get them through their acute setting, and don't burn any bridges in the short term. Bring them back, accept the fact that they're going to develop a hernia, and you can fix it down the road in several months. Same thing for patients that are inadequately pre-opt. Um, we want to optimize our patients before we uh, start uh, disrupting tissue planes. Patients that are malnourished, uh, they're active smokers, diabetic, or obese. Again, these are patients, you got to get them fine-tuned before you start dissecting these planes and burning your bridges. And the last thing I'll say on this is when to avoid is uh, for these small to medium-sized defects. Um, as much as I love doing TAR for a lot of my patients, I do think there's an overuse of transversus abdominis release for defects that aren't necessarily uh, needed for it. Uh, a patient like the picture down there, maybe this is a laparoscopic eye palm repair, maybe this is a retrorectus repair, but a lot of these defects aren't necessarily require uh, that extreme of a dissection out uh, posterior laterally with a TAR. Other considerations is abdominal wall compliance. Um, if you have a patient that's, we have, you have the same size defect with a very compliant abdominal wall that you can get that, that fascia approximated, perhaps a retrorectus is sufficient for it. That said, you could have a smaller defect, but they have a very non-compliant abdominal wall that may be a patient that you have to extend the dissection and complete your transversus abdominis release. Um, how about uh, external oblique release? Now, um, there are some uh, surgeons I've heard that have advocated you start with one release, and if you don't have enough, do an additional, meaning you do an external oblique release, or you start with a tar, and if that's not enough, do your uh, anterior comp uh, your posterior component separation. And I would strongly discourage this. Remember, we only have three uh, uh, myofascial 
uh, areas on the lateral wall. If you dissect two of those three, I mean, if you dissect your external oblique and your transversus abdominis, you're left with only internal oblique, and that can lead to destabilization, destabilization of the abdominal wall. Um, and I'll show a picture of that in a sec. Um, now, how about recurrence? Let's say somebody had a remote external oblique release. Uh, Eric Pauli, who's going to be coming up next, wrote a great paper about this. And uh, these are challenging patients. These are patients that, um, yes, TAR can be done after uh, somebody's fully healed from external oblique release. Uh, but that said, it should be used um, very cautiously and probably in select uh, hands, people that have a lot of experience with this. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to skip some of this stuff. Uh, I was going through some technique and. Uh, um, anatomy stuff, but um, really important, when you're planning out your TAR, you've done your retrorectus uh, release, um, next step is to divide your transversus abdominis. Take the time to identify the anatomy. Make sure you are medial to the linea semilunaris. And Victor uh, pointed out this out earlier. Um, the problem is if you get lateral to your semilunar line, you can disrupt that area, you can get into your uh, external oblique, you can get into your internal oblique, and you can totally destabilize the abdominal wall. As you can see from these pictures, either bilateral or unilateral, these are disaster hernias to fix. They're very challenging. So uh, spend a few minutes, identify the anatomy, make sure you're in the correct dissection plane. Uh, Outcome-wise, uh, largest TAR uh, database right now, uh, over 400 patients. Uh, looking at the outcomes, very reasonable surgical site occurrence, infection rate. Out of these 400 plus patients, not a single mesh had to be removed. Certainly we had some SSIs, uh, but uh, none of the meshes had to be removed. Very reasonable recurrence rate there, uh, with five of those recurrences due to central mesh failure. So, uh, wonderful outcome. So, uh, to conclude, uh, TAR is advantageous for a large variety of wide and complex ventral hernias. It really is true giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac. It really is, if you're embarking on complex ab wall, I think it's one of the essential options in your armamentarium. Um, uh, that said, um, if I go to that bottom bullet, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, I do think there's an overuse of tar. Uh, there's a challenging anatomy, so I can encourage people that are embarking on this, uh, go to courses, do spend time in the cadaver lab, uh, do some shadowing, do some mentoring, uh, so we can uh, optimize and uh, do the best uh, repair for our patients. Thank you very much.